Assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, today's halakha is a little different because we're trying out a different form of an online halakha. Um, usually we would do Zoom meetings that people would attend or before that we would meet every Friday and then we would do in-person halakhas. But both of those are not possible at the moment. So we're trying out a different form of online halakha and it comes in a form of a checklist. So we have a few things for people to work through on their own throughout the week or in one day, however every, however anyone wants to do it. And this is a portion of that checklist. So each week we'll have somebody do a presentation on a topic related to the theme of the month. And this month's theme is Tawheed, so the oneness of Allah. And this presentation is related to sihr or magic, as it is known in English. So before we even begin this conversation, I think it's important to note that although magic isn't practiced in Islam, and as Muslims we should not practice any form of sihr, these words I'm going to use interchangeably, um, we still believe that magic exists and whatever happens, happens by the will of Allah. So now that that's out of the way, we can talk about sihr. So the word sihr comes from the Arabic word sihri, which means something that is hidden or something that is part of the unseen. And this can be anything from horoscopes, tarot card readings, fortune telling, black magic, palm readings, anything that's kind of related to that would fall under the umbrella of sihr. And I think we've all at least heard or maybe even seen examples of what this can be. Um, for example, astrology, black magic, casting spells, things like this. And in extreme cases, these kinds of things can translate to real life symptoms such as obsession or the inability to have children, the breaking of bonds in relationships things like that. And in these cases, it is believed that some people will utilize the power of evil jinn by offering them various favors, which is one of the reasons why sihr is not allowed in Islam. And as a disclaimer, I just wanted to say that this next little bit is just my opinion. So although Muslims are forbidden from practicing or observing anything related to sihr, I think that Allah mentioned it in the Quran because he knows that we're humans and that we will eventually make mistakes and the Quran literally serves as a life manual for those who practice Islam so knowing that we're humans who will struggle with their iman constantly throughout our lives I think it makes sense that despite Muslims being forbidden from practicing sihr it was still mentioned in both the Quran and the Sunnah so we know how to navigate these waters um, not because it's something that's encouraged so that was just a tiny piece that I wanted to add in there. Anyway, on to the evidence. So I wanted to start off with a story that took place in Babylon, and this is a story about how magic began. And it began with two angels named Harut and Marut, who were sent down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the intention to test mankind's faith. So Allah sent down these two angels with the knowledge of how to access jinn for the purpose of performing magic or sihr, but of course, there was a huge catch, and this catch was trading your akhirah or your hereafter for this temporary world. And before this knowledge of magic was ever even dispersed, the angels stated to the people that they were sent to that they were a test from Allah, so do not commit kufr by learning from them. And in the ayah that I'm going to mention, which is ayah 102 of Surah Baqarah, it mentions that the thing that they were taught or were going to be taught if they um, were willing to trade in their ahara was something that will cause problems between two people, such as a husband and wife. And of course, um, hearing about this knowledge and thinking about the sense of power that it would provide them, many people gave in. Despite knowing that they would have no share in the ahara, they still gave in. And they thought that what they were learning would only harm other people, but instead what they were learning would only harm them. And in the situation, if you look at it with a deeper lens, I guess, you can see that the ultimate harm that was done to them was, first of all, them 
losing their iman, they also lost their akhra because that was the price they had to pay for this knowledge. And lastly, they started putting their trust in something apart from Allah. So that was a quick little story of how the first magicians came to be. And fun fact, any magic that's still available and practiced today can be traced back to them in one way or another. And the specific type of seher that I want to talk about today um, for a little bit is astrology. And we all know that astrology has existed forever, but it's also trending a lot these days. And usually when things become repetitive and we're surrounded by them, we become desensitized and don't really see those things as a big deal anymore. And I think the same concept can be applied to sins, in this case, believing in horoscopes or placing your trust in astrology. And I have a sahih hadith here narrated by Abu Dawood that explains what the Prophet said about this matter. So the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said that whoever learns anything of astrology has learned a branch of witchcraft or sihr. And I have another hadith here narrated by Al-Bazar. And it says that the Prophet states, He is not one of us who practice augury or has it done for him, who tells fortunes or has his fortune told, or who practices witchcraft or has that done for him. And augury is the interpretation of omens. I say that because I didn't know what it was when I was looking at the Hadith. So anyway, you can see here that placing your trust in astrology and relying on horoscopes is forbidden in Islam, as this is a form of sihr. And this can also be interpreted as a form of shirk, meaning that you are attributing Allah's powers to things that aren't Him. And again, if something was beneficial for us, it wouldn't be forbidden. But there are reasons for everything that we've been commanded to do, and we just have to trust that Allah will do what's best for us, and that's having tawakkul. So let's say you're in a situation where your iman is low. You have multiple things going on in your life and you feel like nothing is going your way and you're not sure how to move forward. If you can't rely on horoscopes, you can't rely on fortune telling, if you can't rely on things that will make you feel better about yourself temporarily, what are you recommended to do? What's crazy to me is that the ayah mentioned immediately after the one I stated earlier, which was ayah 102 of Surah Baqarah, ayah 103 states, and I quote, And had they accepted the faith and been God-fearing, their reward from Allah would have always been far better, if only they knew. End quote. And just for some context here, Allah is speaking of those that learned how to perform and practice sihr. So the reason why I mention this ayah is because it's crazy that Allah says, had they accepted the faith, had they been God-fearing, then they, Allah would reward them way more than what they thought that they would get in this world. If only they knew. And the craziest part is that they did know. They knew that if they hadn't traded in their akhirah for this dunya, then they would have much, much greater rewards. They were told not to go towards kufr, but they still did. So, again, stories are there to serve as reminders to let us know of the mistakes that others have made so that we don't repeat them. And I think the takeaway for me from this ayah is that we need to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead of His creation. He created the jinns that people rely on for magic purposes. He created the angels that came down to the people of Babylon. He created the people that others go to for fortune telling and palm readings and tarot card readings, astrology, horoscopes, all of that. So why would we trust those people, those jinns, those angels, instead of trusting their creator? So that's one way that I think of Tawakko and having trust on Allah, even when my iman is lower, even when I don't think that things are going my way. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always going to have your best interest at heart. Even you sometimes don't have your own best interest at heart. So it's important to understand that nobody loves you more than Allah, not even your own mother. 
So trust in him, leave your affairs to him, and what's best for you will happen. Just don't seek divine guidance apart from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the sunnah of the prophet. So I think that would be my biggest takeaway from this story and this episode is to put your trust in Allah and do not seek divine guidance apart from him, apart from the Quran and apart from the sunnah. And as always, if you ever need any help with anything, please reach out to us and we will try to help you as best as we can. Um, Thank you for listening. I'm not really sure how to end this, but I do know that we're going to at least try to continue these kinds of halakas for the next few weeks, see how they go, and alter what we're doing based on that. If you would like to host something like this or if you want to do a presentation that you want to make accessible to other people please reach out to us and we will try our best to facilitate that we love it when people present at our halakas so we will always welcome that um just reach out to us and let us know um next week we'll be back with another checklist another presentation and it might be a podcast might be a video might be powerpoint i'm not sure But we will leave that up to the next person who will be discussing mindfulness in Islam. So thank you for listening. Assalamu alaikum.